Awesome. All right. So where we're going to kick it off today is on page 28. And uh, we're just going to wrap up there as the solution. Because uh, somebody, that somebody's me, uh, thought she was absolutely going to finish the chapter uh, last week. And that somebody, who is also me, was wrong. So we're going to finish that up today. It's like one and a half pages. So if I can't finish it up this week, it's a me issue, not an anyone else issue. All right, so kicking it off, there is a solution. Very, very, very top of the page. It says, here was the terrible dilemma in which our friend found himself when he had the extraordinary experience, which, as we have already told you, made him a free man. And so who we're talking about this week is, is Roland Hazard. And, and we went through the whole story of, of Roland Hazard. And I'll give the briefest of briefest sort of, um, of reviews. I was going to say history because it was all history. But Roland Hazard, he goes and he's got alcoholism. And what happens for him is once he starts to drink, he, he can't stop. Now, we don't, we don't read that in his story. But we, what we read in his story is that he wants to stop. And he goes to the best psychiatrist, the best psychologist, the best, we'll have a modern interpretation, treatment centers, rehabs, they didn't exist quite in that way. But he went to the best of the best of the best. And he couldn't stay sober. And so he, he, he goes and he ends up working one on one with Dr. Carl Jung. And he works with this guy intensively for a year. And an intensive treatment for a year with one of the most famous psychiatrists in the whole world. Welcome, we're on page 28. With one of the most intensive, famous, well-known, best of the best that ever graced history, he drinks again. And that is the terrible dilemma. That terrible dilemma is that I know that I cannot drink or use or act out on whatever behavior brings you to this study today. But also, that I will do it again. That is the terrible dilemma. I need to stay sober, but I can't stay sober. I have to stay sober, but I can't. That is the terrible dilemma. And so he goes back to Carl Jung and says, dude, and historically accurate, he was definitely saying like, dude, you know, as they talked in the 1930s. Dude, what's up? Uh, so you know, he goes back to back to Carl Jung and says, dude, what happened? And, and Carl Jung has the humility to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I got this wrong. You are an alcoholic and I do not see people like you recover. The only hope there is for people like you is, is what's referred to as a spiritual awakening, a spiritual experience. But the odds of this thing happening to you are like the odds of you getting struck by lightning. You can't just hang out in a church pew and hope it happens. You've got to go out and find it. So in that moment, our guy, Roland Hazard, he knows what he needs and what we need to do or what we need to have in order to recover. And that is a spiritual awakening. And that is our solution in 12 steps. And then when it talks about when he had the extraordinary experience, what happens for him is he gets in contact with the Oxford group, the Oxford movement. And he, they have a series of actions, which later became what, what we know as our 12 steps. And he had a spiritual awakening. And it says, which we have already told you, made him a free man. So the terrible so dilemma is our problem. My mental obsession and my physical allergy. That was his terrible dilemma. And the extraordinary experience was a spiritual a spiritual experience. Another way to say it is our solution, a spiritual awakening, a psychic change. And when it talks about, as we have already told you, made him a free man. What I really want to emphasize about that today is that is what's on offer. Freedom. Freedom. Not just don't drink. Ugh. You know what I mean? Not just hold on until it passes. No. Not, oh, I've got a lot of meetings and call your sponsor. No. Freedom, that is what's on offer. And the freedom that we have, now keep in mind, at, at first, that freedom that we're after and the freedom that we get is freedom from that mental obsession. I get to be in a place where I am recovered, not cured, but recovered, where the mental obsession is removed. And that's going to happen at step 10. I won't bounce us around to the step 10 promises 
because then I really will take the entire hour going through a page and a half, and I won't do that to you guys. But that and freedom from the mental obsession. But I don't know about you. When I was separated from alcohol and I was separated from drugs and, you know, whatever behavior brings you to this study today, there was something that would happen in me where I would be filled with this pain in the depth of my soul that nothing could touch. You know, that anxiety where it feels like somebody is stabbing your shoulder blades. You know, that depression where it's just, I want to pull my, put the covers over my head and I can't get out of bed. You know, that feeling of uselessness and self-pity that we're going to read about in a couple chapters. You know, that feeling that, man, I got these problems and nothing can solve it. I hate myself. I hate who I am. I hate who I've become. What is the point of and meaning of my life? I'm hoping nobody's relating, but if you are, if you are, we have freedom from that as well. That is the freedom that is on offer here in 12 Steps. See, I, I like to talk about this quite a bit. Is I didn't once, not once in my life did I ever come to a drink of alcohol and think, ah, I don't know if that could work for me. No, I was absolutely convinced that alcohol would, could be a solution to my problems. And I'm reminded, if I never sold the power of alcohol or drugs or whatever is bringing me, or if I never sold that power short, to never sell the power of God for these 12 steps short. Freedom, that is what's on offer. And then it says, we in our turn sought the same escape with all the desperation of drowning men. What does it mean to be drowning? Well, I always imagine, imagine a river at flood. You know, back in 2013, we in Calgary, we were just talking about how you pronounce it. Now I have overthought it. I'm like, did I pronounce it right? It doesn't matter. Uh, but we in Calgary in 2013, we had a we had this flood. And if you've ever seen a river at flood, you know, it's that brown water and the current is going. And for me to have this illness is to be like right in the middle of the river. And that river is deep. That water is deep. And my feet can't touch the ground. And that current is taking me. And that current looks a little like the allergy. And see, I start grabbing a hold to rocks and to sticks. And, and you know, it looks like, you know, I'm, I'm going to drink like a lady and it, uh, slip right off that rock. And it looks like, I, it looks like I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to just try using this specific substance this specific way. And I grab a hold of I grab a hold of this thing and it sinks to the ground and, and the current takes me with it. And it also looks like the mental obsession. See, I, I, I you know, I, I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to use drugs. And I grab a hold of maybe therapy and there's nothing wrong with therapy. It, it might be vitally important that I seek therapy, but I grab a hold of therapy and it doesn't work. And I keep drowning. And I grab a hold of that relationship. I'm sure no one else relates to that. And that's that log. And that log like pulls me under and I'm drowning like I made it worse. You know what I mean? I'm sure no one relates to that log relationship. Um, don't look over to your spouse and be like, you're the log. Because the truth is, I might be the log. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but I'll, I'll grab a hold of this and that. And it doesn't work. And see, I can't drink and I can't stay sober. And the more I try, man, nothing is working. And I am drowning. And I know that, man, I'm not going to be able to hold my head above water much longer. And I'm exhausted. That is what it means to be drowning. You know, and I, I remember this time in my life, um, I was I was homeless. I was living on the streets of Calgary and I had a friend that took me out to, uh, took me out to get something to eat and she was just just like flabbergasted she was like what like she did not understand how the person that she knew and the person that she you know we played rugby together that person that seemed like a functional human being had ended up so badly so quickly she did not get it and she it was just she made no sense to her as we're sitting and we're having that that meal at Wendy's, it doesn't matter that it was a Wendy's, but my brain works on geography. So I'm like, it's Wendy's. She, she was asking me, like, Paige, what is your life like? Now, I had no introduction to the big book. I had no introduction to steps. I, in fact, I was pretty sure I didn't have a problem. Uh, but the, but the be, I, what I, how I answered is the best way that I could describe the life as I am living it is like I am drowning. For me, it was like being in the middle of the ocean and there was no help around and I am slowly drowning. And see, I come to a place like this, you know, I come to the rooms of 12 step and it says, what seemed at first a flimsy reed 
And I come to a place like this with people like you, with the lights are on and the smiles in your face and the hope that is in your heart. It seemed at first a flimsy read. And y'all tell me you have recovered. And y'all tell me that you took some actions out of this little blue book that was written in 1939. And a spiritual experience made this possible. And that feels, doesn't it feel like a flimsy read? I'm sure I'm, sure I'm the only one. Welcome. Glad you're here. We're on page 28. I'm sure I'm the only one here that has ever, ever been like, listen, I don't know if the steps can work for me. I'm so complicated and different and unique. You know what? I, I'm sure I'm the only one. I'm sure y'all saw them and were like, I'm so jazzed. I can't wait to do a searching and fearless moral inventory. And I'm sure none of us had any issue with doing a fifth step or telling anyone anything. Amends even to our ex, no issue there. Who wouldn't want to pray and meditate? Got no problems with God helping other alcoholics or addicts or whatever. Goodness, no, we're all so reasonable and unselfish. I have no issue with that. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I fought it. And I didn't think it would work. And it's like, no, I got all these problems you don't understand. But I grab a hold of this flimsy reed. And I grab a hold of it and, and keep in mind that current is coming and it's gotten. And it feels like this read that's okay. I'm going to read this stupid book with my stupid sponsor and do these stupid steps for a stupid spiritual awakening. See, I don't got to be all the way willing. I've got to be a little willing. And I grab a hold of that. And it just feels like it's going to rip out of the riverbed like everything else and go with me and be another failed attempt. But as I grab a hold and I have to grab a hold, I have to dive in and how I grab a hold is these 12 steps. I dive in, I grab in my hand. It says, what seemed at first a flimsy read has proved based on experience, proved to be the loving and powerful hand of God. That read in my hand turns to God's hand, turns into God's hand, picking me out of the water and safely to the riverbank. That is what happens here. It's, it's not spiritual water wings. You know what I mean? It is out, out, freedom, safety. That is what is on offer. And it says a new life has been given us. And I'm going to point out uh, new life sort of implies it's a way of living. So for those of you who've been coming, you know, I'm going to answer, I emphasize quite a lot, way of life, way of life, way of life. I don't get to set it and forget it. I got to keep working this thing. Or if you prefer, if you're like, mm, I don't know about a new life, that seems a little much. Or if you prefer a design for living, oh, that's just another way to say way of life, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So it's going to be a way of life. And it says, that really works. See, yeah, I didn't mean for this to be. Oftentimes when I do this study, my brain cups, comes up with metaphors that I'm as surprised by as, as well as everyone else. This isn't spiritual water wings. This isn't, you know, throwing, throwing a little rubber ducky to me as I'm drowning. This is something that works. Man, and I would not be doing this if it did not work. It works. Freedom and real freedom at depth is what is on offer. And it says the distinguished American psychologist William James in his book, Varieties of Religious Experience. And if you're wondering, if you look at Rob on Rob's screen, uh, right behind him is, is William James. And he was this American psychologist. And we spoke last week about how he maybe had planted a seed with Carl Jung about the possibility of, of you know, religious experiences, spiritual experiences, spiritual awakenings. And uh, his book was actually a series of lectures that he gave um, in Scotland. And uh, it's it's known for being a bit of a dry book. Um, but man, there is some, there are some absolute gems in that book. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying you have to read it or anything like that. I'm just saying I've really enjoyed listening to it. But that maybe tells you what a giant, nerd that I am you know what I mean I'm like Woo! varieties of religious experiences <laughs> you know it's it's like my jam but it opens up to the spirituality and it just uh, I had an incredible experience listening to it and and uh yeah and just the idea that spirituality was not this linear set thing just opened up as I was listening to it and it connected some dots for me and and yeah that's that's what we're talking about, a spiritual experience, 
a religious experience. Now, religion carries baggage, spiritual experience. He didn't have another way to describe it. And it says it indicates a multitude of ways in which men have discovered God. And that's what we're talking about. God of your own belief or understanding or lack of understanding what you bring to the table is enough. And we're going to talk about that in two chapters. And it says, we have no desire to convince anyone that there is only one way by which faith can be acquired. And see, what we're doing here is acquiring faith. I don't need to start with faith. I need to acquire it through action. In step two, see, this is not the step two talk, but I'm, I'm kind of off on that tangent. I've been known to go off on those. Uh, a little peninsula of my mind thoughts just as we were talking about bodies of water. Uh, but what, what we're talking about there is I don't need to believe in, I need to believe that. I just need to believe that there is a solution. And I will take action that will allow me to experience the solution. And that's what we're after. And what we have here in 12 Step is a way that works. It works. So we're not trying to convince any anyone of anything, but what we have is a way that works for us. And it says, if what we have learned and felt and seen means anything at all. See, this is not an intellectual exercise. Not what I think, not what I believe. No, what we have learned. How did we learn it? Through experience. Seen through experience, right? And felt, felt is experiential. This is an experiential process. If what we have experienced means anything at all, it means that all of us, all of us, all of us, even you, even me, all of us are the children of a living creator. And one of the things or all of us, we're whatever, our race, creed, our color, regardless of, regardless of, you know what I mean? Regardless of the things that I think that make me different, regardless of, you know, this is a book written in 1939. I don't know if you're aware of how open this paragraph is. Regardless of who you are, your spirituality is enough, is a starting place. We're not going to ask you to believe anything else. And regardless of, and I'm just, it doesn't say this, but I'm going to point out regardless of that secret that we hold, regardless of that shame that I bring to the table, or the regardless of the way that I think I'm so much worse than anyone else, regardless of that, regardless of what I think, we are the children of a living creator. And I love the saying that God does not have grandkids, only kids, that there is not a separation from God. So that we are right there, intimate with God. And if, if man, if, if you're like, man, she's talking a lot about God, what I mean is a conception that you're open to. But that idea that you are intimately loved is intimately loved as a healthy parent-child relationship, intimately loved. And something else. See, if we are all the children of a living creator, what that means is I will never, and I mean never, look into the face or look into the eyes of someone God does not love. That might change how I show up to relationships. That might change how I show up to traffic. I would say traffic. I don't drive. It's really easy for me to deal with traffic. But that might change how I show up to life. I will never look in the face of somebody God does not love. And it says the children of a living creator. And I just love that idea of God as a present tense verb. God in the here and now. And not God in the here and now sitting on a cloud. If, if you're open to that, wonderful. But in judging and condemning. No, God here and now acting and moving. God here and now. God action. A verb. A children of a living creator with whom we may form a relationship. Upon simple and understandable terms, relationship. And I love that idea of approaching a power greater than myself in a relational way. Anyone here ever find date? Now, keep in mind, we're a group of people who don't actually have a lot of history of dating. I mean, not to, not to make the joke. I mean, how do you know when an alcoholic or an addict is on a second date? They showed up in the driveway with their two garbage bags full of stuff. You know what I mean? So we don't always have a lot of history of dating necessarily. Uh, but you know, when you're dating someone, you go on that first date, it's a little awkward and uncomfortable 
and you don't know what to say. A little like how we first start praying. You know what I mean? And then over time. Now, not over time. See, if you go on a first date with somebody and then 10 years later, you go on a second date, you're not going to feel any more connected. But with consistency, with consistent sharing, listening, you know, doing things together, you build a relationship. Now, some of you are married or in, in a long-term relationship and, and you know that that person has now become that like, that person you want to, hopefully, you want to share those things that you're excited about. You want to share your fears with and you grow together. See, it's built with consistency. Now, those of you who are married well, or in a long-term relationship, do know that if you do not speak to your spouse, if you do not listen to your spouse, that one too, and you do not do things together, you're not going to feel connected. And see, that's that idea of relationship. And I love viewing this, this, this idea of like building a relationship with God. Because, man, when I get here, I don't have it. But I got to build it. How do I build it? The actions of the 12 steps and consistency with it. And so when I was new and struggling or when I had stopped doing the actions and I felt disconnected, it made sense why. And it made sense what I needed to do. And those simple and understandable terms, man, I just got to seek, I got to do. And it says, as soon as we are willing and honest enough to try, that is what is asked of me. Not be perfect, try. Try it what? These 12 steps as a way of life. That's what I'm trying at. That. Yeah, I'm going to have to pray. Yeah, I'm going to have to meditate. Yeah, I'm going to have to do these things. Try it this. This is what I'm doing. And I love this. It says, those having religious affiliations will find here nothing disturbing to their beliefs or ceremonies nothing there is no friction among us over such matters and how cool is that that the belief that you bring to the table is enough and i i happen to be this is i'm a giant nerd and there are people who will 100 percent attest to this uh i'm a big big old nerd and a big old spiritual nerdy weirdo and I love seeking from various faiths and traditions and books. Like, I love that. And in step 11, it encourages us to see where religions are right. And I'm like, yeah, and I go hard and I love it. And you know, one of the coolest things is that's what I found to be true. That there is no friction with healthy spirituality. And you know what I found? If it's truth, it's truth. And if it is true, like real, true spirituality, truth, it's found almost anywhere in any faith -based, healthy faith-based tradition. If it's true, it's true. And I think there's some Bill Dubs and, and just how it all, Bill Wilson, sorry, I sometimes call him Billy Dubs because we're friends like that. Um, but he, they, they struck upon something that is deep truth, no friction. You can have a belief and a faith and a religion and a religious tradition and there's nothing in contrast when it's healthy spirituality. And it says, we think it no concern of ours what religious bodies our members identify themselves with as individuals. We're not asking you to believe a certain thing, believe in a certain God, believe in a certain way. No, we will ask you to do some certain things that you probably don't want to do, but we're not going to ask you to believe in a certain way. Those things are the steps. And it says, this should be an entirely personal affair, which each one decides for himself in the light of past associations or his present choice. Not all of us join religious bodies, but most of us favor such membership. And I just want to point out that last line. Because if you're here today and, and man, I'm mentioning the word God and you're a little like, mm, or I'm talking about religion and you get a little, mm, I hear you. I was like that. You know what I mean? But I want to point out this book. It was published in 1939 and it was meant to go out and carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I might be a single alcoholic living in Calgary, Alberta, not having the privilege of Zoom or an intergroup or a central office or a sponsor or meetings, only a copy of this book. And I have to follow its directions to get well. And when it says most of us join religious bodies, it makes sense. I'm now on a spiritual path, a spiritual way of life. I have the privilege of being able to go around on the internet and do different meditations and we podcasts and speaker tapes and Zoom meetings and big book studies. And we're talking about some of our favorite speakers before the meeting, like all of that. Well, if I lived in Calgary, Alberta in 1941 and I wanted to grow spiritually, I'd probably go to church 
just because that's what was available. So I just want to contextualize that. No one's forcing you to go to church of any faith or any religion unless you want to. And if you want to, heck yeah, heck yeah, do that. But make sure we stay rooted and grounded in this because I don't want to float out the door on, you know, on a, on a cloud of zeal. I want to be grounded in this. And when I'm grounded in this, man, I get to show up to every area of my life in a way I never thought possible. So it says in the following chapter, which it looks like we might get to today. I'm having a lot. I'm like, ooh, look at the chart. <laughs> but in the following chapter, there appears an explanation of alcoholism as we understand it. And we're going to really dive into the mental obsession and the hopelessness of alcoholism in the chapter. It's more about alcoholism. Then a chapter addressed to the agnostic, and that chapter is going to laser beam in on step two. Many who were once in this class are now among our members. Surprisingly enough, we find such convictions, which is a belief, no great obstacle to the spiritual experience. Sounds like what I believe is not as important as what I do, which is, we'll really get into that in we agnostics. Yeah. Further on, clear cut directions are given, showing how we recovered. There's that word again, not cured but recovered. The mental obsession has been removed. And I love that it is clear cut directions. And that's why I'm a line by line girl. I like going line by line. I don't want to miss the directions. And what I will say is they are clear cut directions. And in my experience, there's, there is a little bit of wiggle room. So if I'm giving you a direction that comes from this book and it's a little bit different than what your sponsor says, I'm not right. Your sponsor's not wrong. Your sponsor's not right. I'm not wrong. Or I can be wrong. You know what? Your sponsor's right. I'm wrong. Well, I'll just be wrong. That's so much easier is what I've learned. <laughs> you, you can dive into this. Yeah, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. But your sponsor's not. Like there are some slight differences in, in how we lay out inventory or that sort of thing. And that's okay. But I want to I wanna follow this thing clear cut. I want to follow those directions because I want, I want this experience. This is each individual in the personal stories describes in his own language and from his own point of view, the way he established his relationship with God, because that's what I'm after that relationship. That's the solution. And I love the idea is, isn't that what I'm called to do when I share my story? Because the personal stories, that's what they're meant to do. Again, the book goes out into the world. I'm imagining I'm in 1940 in Calgary, Alberta. I got no other alcoholics. And I got to re read this book to see that a little redheaded ginger like me can recover. You know what I mean? I got I to gotta get the chapter to the gingers, you know? <laughs> like, I got I to gotta see that somebody like me, and, and maybe that's the thing. It's, I, at least for me, I, I, when I share my story, I really would like to focus on the symptoms, but then on, on the actions and the results. So... And uh, these give a fair cross-section of our membership and a clear-cut idea of what has actually happened in their lives. Again, an ex a pointing to experience, not a what they think now and what they believe now, but what has happened in the transformation that has not just happened, I don't drink today, but what has happened in their lives. Man, there's freedom on offer. And it says, we hope that no one will consider these self-revealing accounts of bad taste. Our hope, is, like, you know, we hope no one's going to get offended by this, being so open and honest. We, our hope is that many alcoholic men and women desperately in need will see these pages. And we believe it is only by fully disclosing our, ourselves and our problems that they will be persuaded to say, yes, I am one of them too. I must have this thing. Awesome. So now let's pop over to page 30. And we're going to rock and roll with the chapter, More About Alcoholism. Now, more about alcoholism, what we're really going to lens in on is the mental obsession. And as we go through the chapter, More About Alcoholism, we're going to really see a number of synonyms for the mental ob obsession. And a synonym is just a word that means the same thing as, as something else. So words that mean mental obsession or where they're pointing to mental obsession, but they're going to they're gonna use some fancy words. And we're going to really laser beam on the hopelessness of this illness. And we're going to see a couple stories. We got, we got some great stories coming up. I won't spoil them, but we got our, we got our man of 30. We got, uh, we got the jaywalker. We got Fred. We got Jim. Oh, we got, oh, 
oh yeah the Thai term same same but different is a is a synonym that is so simple same same but different yeah so we got some same same but different uh and for those um not super well versed in Thai vernacular synonyms <laughs> I'm, I'm so here for that some of you guys will know I'm really in, in etymology and language stuff. It was the big book that got me jazzed about that. Any oodles. Um, and so we're going to see that in those stories, we're going to see their examples of the cycle. And we're going to point that out and, and we'll see, you know, where people have sworn off and said they're never going to do it again. We're going to point to some of that feeling of restless, irritable discontent. We're going to see when the mental obsession clicked. And we're going to see what their allergy looked like. And so we're going to really see examples of the cycle. Now, there's also going to be two. I'm just going to let you know. There's two. Uh, if you're like, listen, I don't want to I don't want to come to this big book study and like read stuff. Lame. Uh, we've got two experiments. So if you don't want to if you don't want to read the big book, that's cool. We have two experiments that you can go out and try. But you don't have to. So that'll be what we're diving into. So chapter three, more about alcoholism. Most of us had been unwilling to admit that we were real alcoholics. Does that sound familiar? I, did, I didn't want to think I was really that bad. I thought, mm, maybe I got a case of diet alcoholism, alcoholism light, you know what I mean? And it says no person likes to think he is bodily. Now, when we're talking about bodily different, we're talking about the physical allergy. Once I start, I cannot stop and I need more. That's a physical allergy. And mentally different from his fellows. Mentally, it's the mental obsession. And the mental obsession is the thought that happens when I'm as sober as I am today and my illness is untreated. It looks a little like this time will be different. Nobody will ever know. I'll go out for three drinks or my problem was crack, but I can drink like a lady or my problem is booze, but I can smoke crack like a lady. Just me. Okay. <laughs> You know, or it's, you know, where it looks like I don't think at all. There's this blind spot and I'm drinking and I do or use it and I don't know how. You know what I mean? That's what we're pointing to. Bodily, physical allergy, mentally, mental obsession, different from his fellows. So that spiritual malady, that feeling of restless, irritable discontent, that's not necessarily limited to people like us. But people like us are the only ones that have the physical allergy and the mental obsession. Non-alcoholics do not have them. And so it says, therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers, anyone else made a career out of it? You know, it was more than a full-time job. It was, ooh, I was going up the real corporate ladder by which um, it was it was stumbling down the ladder is what it was, you know, climbing up the corporate ladder of my alcoholism, thump, 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 crash. That's what it was, you know? <laughs> Oh, but drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts. So to do something is in vain is like it doesn't work. So this attempt that didn't work to prove that we could drink like other people. We ever try to prove that we could do it like other people. We could drink like a lady or yeah, or or a fancy person or a gentleman. You know what I mean? I thought I could do it. Now it says the idea that somehow, someday he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession we talk about obsession great obsession that's a synonym that's a same thing but different uh for the mental obsession and and uh is astonishing so um is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker and what i want to point out is if i am trying to exhibit some control over the physical allergy some control over my drinking I am not enjoying it. Let me let me just let me just throw something out here. Uh, can anyone here imagine anything worse than me saying you can have one drink, one, and then taking it away, like oh, you know, like one, and then you're done. Oh, or if you've been in a situation where you can only have one, and it just sets that off, and it's like oh, you know what I mean. There is no enjoyment. It is me just like, I need more, I need more, I need more. It's screaming inside most of the time. You know what I mean? And if I'm enjoying it, girl, I am not controlling it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm enjoying it. We're going. Yeah, we're going hard. But to have control and enjoyment, that is something, man, 
this time I'm gonna I'm gonna go for three. This time I, I'm just I'm gonna have water in between, or I'm gonna have a good meal before, or I'm gonna you know I'm gonna stop by 9 p.m. Whatever those ways, man, and it doesn't work. Control and enjoy is the great obsession of every abnormal drink. And it says the persistence of this illusion, and that illusion is another synonym for the mental obsession because it is not real. It is the lie. It is an illusion. And it says is astonishing. Many pursue it into, and I want to emphasize into, into the gates of insanity or death. Because everyone here, including myself, I mean, I shouldn't say everyone here, but I thought I would be an up to. You know what I mean? I thought I would get up to the gates of insanity or death. I thought I would let it get bad, but I'll be able to turn it around before it gets that bad. Yes, it's a problem. Yes, I'm dying, but I'm not going to die. And unfortunately, the graveyards and the morgue and the hospitals are filled with people like me who thought I was an up to sort of person. The reality is, if I have this illness, lack of control, lack of choice, I do not have the privilege to decide whether I will be into or up to. That, that is the reality. I will drink my or use myself into permanent brain damage, permanent life altering situations, or until I die. That is my reality. That's what's on offer. If I am trying to, if I have this illness and I'm trying to do it my way, it's not good. And it says we learned that we had to fully concede. Now, concede, I, I looked it up in my 1930s dictionary in case, uh, in ca oh, nice, yeah. Yeah, uh, we're going to talk about that here in a sec. Rob puts things in the chat uh, and then I look at them. And then I get excited, but also distracted. So uh, if you're missing out, good, not just not badly distracted, don't you worry. Yeah, concede. So he's got the definition and, and uh, admit, agree, accept. I looked it up in my 1930s dictionary. Mine is not the, mine is, we joke, the unofficial, unofficial 1930s dictionary, because it's extra unofficial. It's just a random dictionary that I had from the 1930s. And the, the concede in mine said yield or admit. So I'm admitting, I'm I'm not almost like surrendering, like I'm seeing. So we learned that we had to fully concede, admit to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. And if you're writing in your book, you can put a little star and you can write step one, because this is where step one is found in the book. So we have to fully admit, and it, you know what's interesting? I need to fully admit to whom? Not to my sponsor, not to my rehab, Exactly. I need to admit to me. I need to concede to me. Why? Because I am the one that needs to be convinced. My mother, my partner, my uh, spouse, that's a synonym for partner. Uh, hopefully I don't have two of those. Uh, but like, you know, the people in my life, they don't need to be convinced of my alcoholism. I need to be convinced of my alcoholism. You know why? Because I'm the only one that can do anything about it. It does not matter what they believe or what they think. It matters if I am convinced because if I am not convinced I have this thing, do these steps, do that, you know what I mean? But if I am convinced that I have this illness, there's nothing left for me but to pick up these tools. Because the reality is, so what, it, what does it mean to fully concede to my innermost self that I'm an alcoholic? Or that I'm an addict, or that you know I'm I'm hopeless over what brings me to the study. So what that looks like is, of course, when we hear it at rooms in the rooms all the time. I I know I'm an alcoholic. I can never ever drink again. I've got step one. That's I'm an alcoholic. I can't ever drink. That's only part of it. That's an important part of it to know that I have the allergy and I can't ever drink again. The second part to step one is to understand that I will. I can never, ever, ever safely drink or use drugs for somebody like me, mind-altering substances ever again. I, that, I can't ever. And oh my goodness, I will. I have to stay sober and I can't. That is step one. The deep and powerful confession that I will drink again. No matter how much I need to stay sober, no matter how much I have to stay sober, no matter how much I want to stay sober, I'm going to drink again. That is a step one. And that, I, that was, that was even before I came to the rooms, I mean, that was my step one experience. It was, it happened to be my last, my last use happened to be, I didn't, I didn't decide, 
it happened to be. And I had this, this, I, this knowing it wasn't the worst. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the worst thing that I had ever done. I didn't go on a, yeah, admit often against my will. Yeah. My, I had my, uh, my arm twisted by this illness. You know, I was forced into this. I had to look at myself and see who I really was. So what happened for me is it, it wasn't, it wasn't the worst thing that had ever happened to me. It wasn't my lowest of bottoms or anything like that. But I could just in that moment see quite clearly that there was nothing that I could do to stop myself from it getting to that terrible, terrible place again. I could see the reality that I was going to use again and that it, and I was going to end up back where I back back to the worst things that had ever happened to me in my active addiction. That's where I was going to be. And I could see that clearly. And that was my step one experience. And I talk about, I, you know, I use the word bottom and I, I, oh, we got, we got stuff in the chat. Give me one second and I'll, I'll try to read it quickly as we go. Uh, love it, by the way, here for it. Unless it's a criticism, in which case, as I've already told you, criticisms we don't send in the chat. We send them by carrier pigeon. We send them to Steve by carrier pigeon. <laughs> I just, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh that that was my experience. And and I talking about bottoms is man, I, I don't know if bottom, I don't bottom doesn't seem to be a thing, a real thing that I've seen or I've experienced. See what happens is I hit this wall of pain. And I'm hurting and I'm desperate. And what opens up is a window of willingness, a window where I'm willing to take actions I wasn't willing to take to do things that I wasn't willing to do, to see myself as I really am. And if I take action in there, I will have, if I take the action out of these steps, I will have a spiritual awakening. And if I don't, what's my experience? That window will close and I will drink again. See, that's why I'm not big on that language. You got to find your bottom and hit your bottom. No, if I'm willing to take action, take action, do it. I can't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, if I have a window of willingness, and if I take action in it and I have the spiritual awakening and the result of these steps, I'm good. But it doesn't matter how beaten or broken or devastated I am. That is not enough to keep me sober. If I do not take this action, I'm going to drink again. And, and so that's my, that's my controversial hot take on bottoms. I don't know. Uh, Any hoodle. And so, oh man, it says the delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. Now delusion is another synonym for mental obsession. You know, I can't see the truth and the false. I can't see what's real. So that it's insane, that idea that no, no, I'm not really an alcoholic. No, no, it's not that bad. I can get it under control. It has to be smashed. And some of you guys know that I like to make stickers, like design stickers. I just, I forgot about this. I made this, this one sticker that says delusion smashers. Woo yeah. And it's got a little brick that says page 30. Cause it's, yeah, I, I got to you know how it's calling Bill Wilson, Billy Dubs? It's it's because I have a little Billy Dubs sticker that I made. We're good friends like that. <laughs> Just random, random page things. Any oodles. So we've got to smash that delusion. I got to see clearly that, man, I'm not like other people. I have lack of control, lack of choice. I am going to drink again. And it says, we alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. Now we're pointing to control in this, in this little bit here. We're talking about the allergy that I don't have the ability to have control once I start. And it says, we know that no real alcoholic ever, ever recovers control. All of us felt at times like we were regaining control. Did we have a time in our life where it was like, hey, I'm drinking I'm a couple of days, a couple of weeks, you know, I'm all right. I got a little bit of control. Well, such intervals, usually brief, usually brief. Yeah, sound a little accurate. Were inevitably, which means always, followed by still less control, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I'm beaten and I'm broken. And I, I would, I would often joke, pitiful and uncomprehensible demoralization. Oh, my old friend, I knew him well. You know what I mean? Those periods where I had a little bit of control and it's always followed by it being worse than it was before. And it says, we are convinced to a man, to a man means without exception. We are convinced that without exception, 
alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Progressive as in it gets worse over time. In fact, it goes on to say over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. Is that my experience? You know, and we can look at those times we've gone in and out. If we've gone in and out, or we can look at what our drinking was like 10, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and what it looks like today. Is it a downward trajectory? Is that true for me? And, you know, just my experiences I've found is, and I don't want to say it's progressive when I'm sober, but, you know, we do see that people, and we're going to read the man of 30, where he took a drink after 25 years of sobriety, and he was worse than ever before. But what I've found too, and, and maybe it's a gift of 12 steps, is that I don't have the same leeway that I, I, leeway, what I mean is pain tolerance. I don't have the same pain tolerance that I did when I got here. When I got here, I could be miserable for extended stretches. I don't know about you, but I could be resentful and afraid and justify and point out why they are wrong and I am right. And don't they don't know how, to need to, how they need to change, you know what I mean? And I could live in that for a while. And over the years with consistent action, I don't have the ability to live in that pain anymore. And it is painful. It is painful. There's nothing worse than being right and they need to change. It's awful because that's not going to happen. Uh, I need to change. You know what I mean? I And so what I've found is over time, my pain tolerance gets lower. But the gift in that is because I'm doing the work, it drives me back to the work. And the more that I do this work, these 12 steps, the more I'm led to have that relationship with a God of my own understanding that I didn't know and I didn't like and I didn't believe in when I got here. And I get to have that experience today. And it says, we are like men who lost their legs. We never grow new ones. Oh, goodness. Don't we at the meetings love uh, the pickle metaphor? We just love that. Like, oh, it's once you're a pickle, you can never become a cucumber again. And we laugh and it's great. You know, and I, I actually don't mind it. Uh, but the problem is uh, my brain tells me I'm a cucumber and I think I can cuke umber. You know, that's my, that is my weirdest metaphor today. I'll own it. Uh, but the thought is that like, I, I'm a pickle and we're like, we're, you're, you're pickled. You're always going to be pickled, but I won't remember that I'm pickled and I will drink again. And it says, neither does there appear to be any kind of treatment, which will make alcoholics of our kind like other men. And I want to point out this book published 1939, we still don't have a way to cure alcoholism or addiction, or what brings you to the study. Man, we're going to talk in, in uh, the next chapter about how maybe one day they will put man on a moon. Dude, we had a rover on Mars so long that it died, and then I felt a little sad, even though it was a robot. You know, <laughs> that's just my codependency. Like, we have a mass, I mean, we are here on Zoom. You know what I mean? We've had massive advances in technology, and we still don't have a solution for alcoholism other than a powerful spiritual experience as the result of the 12 steps. That kind of tells me, man, that is a couple things. It tells me there are maybe some things that only God can help. But also, that's how in trouble I am. You know what I mean? A rocket ain't going to do it. You know, the most intricate nanotechnology AI is not going to do it. I need a relationship with a power greater than myself. That's what I need. Nothing less than that. And I am going to drink again. And it says, um, it's, it says, in some instances, there's been a brief recovery. Had we had periods where we put it down for a week, a month, several months, heck, we're going to talk about maybe even a year at one point. Brief recovery followed always, always by a still worse relapse. Was that my experience? Anytime I'm like, that's it. I'm going back to the rooms. I'm going back to 12 step. And I go to the meetings. I don't pick up the steps. I don't pick up the actions. And I inevitably pick up the drink or the drug or whatever. And it gets worse. And it says, physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree there's no such thing as making a normal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish this. But, he ha but it hasn't done so yet. Again, it's 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 been we're you know a number of decades almost in and around 80 years i can't i'm realizing i can't do the math that quickly in my head uh but and we still don't have that uh yeah we still don't have 
that uh, have freedom. And I, I just forgot that I was going to go back to the chats. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so and then that one is control is mentioned five times on page 30. That that was something Rob had pointed out five times control and alluding to lack of control, lack of control, lack of control. And we're also going to see in this chapter a lack of choice. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking that might be a good place to leave it because I don't know if I can do the next two paragraphs in five minutes. So why don't we why don't we leave it there? So I'll uh, stop the recording. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming. It's really the, the privilege privilege for me. So thank you so much.